Well, thank you all very much for coming to my talk. As Lena, uh, as Lena just said, my talk today is about my current research entitled Meat is Murder, Cannibalism, Warfare, and Food Shortages in, in Renaissance Rome. I'm going to start today by telling you a little bit about how I came to this research topic, because I understand many of you are doing research right now, so it might be useful to thinking about how historians come to their own research topics. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the results that I have found and then why they matter. So the way I came to this research project was I found an incredible story. I was doing research in the Vatican archives, and I found a series of pamphlets that alleged a horrible crime had been committed in Rome and received a horrible punishment. In 1644, four Norcini, which is the Italian word for pork butchers, were burned to death in Rome atop a large stage erected in front of the Pantheon. This is a contemporary map. The Pantheon is here. It's a 2nd century AD Roman monument. This gruesome punishment, being burned alive, was deemed an appropriate punishment for the crimes that the pork sellers had committed. They were convicted of killing not just pigs, but seven of their fellow Roman citizens, stripping the meat from the bodies and then grinding it together with pork to make sausage. These sausages were then sold to the Roman populace from their shop, again, behind the Pantheon, so right there. This is a crazy story. And I think a lot of times when historians begin their research, they're inspired by one of two moments. Either a moment where it's a thousand years ago, but it looks just like now, or moments where you're like, what the hell were they thinking? And this is one of the latter moments where I was like, what could possibly be going on here? And so finding this pamphlet spurred me onto this research topic. Before I tell you more about that, I think it's worth talking, um, well, here is the pamphlet. So this is the actual source that I found, uh, relation of the inf infamous and detestable excesses by four, anyways, I won't go into it, but this is, this is the cannibal butcher pamphlet. It's about 15 pages long. I said I found it in the Vatican archives. Uh, I just like to talk briefly about the Vatican archives for two reasons. One, it's cool, but it also tells you a little bit about, about how historians practice their craft. The Vatican archives, until about three years ago, was called the Vatican Secret Archives. They changed the name because of conspiracy theories. There were secrets inside. Segreto in Renaissance Italian actually means private. This is the private archive of the popes. So even if there's not any conspiracy going on, that's still super cool because the popes have been around for a long time. Their private archives contain documents going all the way back to the fourth century AD. So from the 300s, there's codexes from the 300s in this archive. You may have seen it in movies like Angels and Demons. I assure you they can't cut off the air supply. They don't even have air conditioning, which is brutal if you're doing research there in the heat of summer. It also tells you something, though this archive is neat, but it also tells you something about how much work there is left to be done by historians. A lot of times when I tell people I study Europe in the period before 1800, they're like, don't we already know everything about that? The Vatican shows how little we know. Of the literally millions of documents in this archive, only a third of them have been cataloged. By that I mean, for you to even be able to go into the archive and call the document up, it has to exist in a catalog somewhere, at least with one line and a shelf mark so they can find it. Only a third have been cataloged. Two thirds are sitting in a back room somewhere in loose boxes, things in old handwriting that is difficult to figure out what's even in them. So there's tons left out there to find. Of the third that have been cataloged, hundreds of them have not been looked at in centuries, if not millennia. And the cannibal butcher narrative that I was looking at was one of these. As far as I could tell, it told a story that no one had yet found. Now, finding a new story does not necessarily make it interesting, right? I mean, you might find a new story about Dirt from, the, well, dirt could be really interesting, about rock collecting in the 16th century. That might not be that interesting. This pamphlet, partially because of the weird nature of it and what's being said inside it, told a really important story that I needed to follow up on. This pamphlet, in part because it talks about cannibalism, signaled to me as a historian that there was something very unusual going on here, and this might be a window into it. 
cannibalism, I mean, even now it's considered a really bad crime, but especially in this period, was considered a truly horrific crime, one that broke both uh, natural boundaries, like you're not supposed to eat your own kind, but also spiritual moral boundaries. You were truly Satan's brood if you ate other people. So the fact that this accusation is in here was striking to me. So I figured that this must tell us something important. So I started looking more into this document. And let me say something about this document for a second. Oh, I, I'm getting past my slides here. This document's produced during the reign of this guy, Pope Urban VIII. A lot of documents like that are produced in this moment. By which I mean not a lot of documents about cannibalism, but a lot of documents about crime. I think now, you know, there's a real fascination with true crime, right? You go to Netflix, there's Mind Hunter, there's podcasts like My Favorite Murder and Serial, there's dozens of them, right? And even if you're not talking about true crime, there's also the fictionalized accounts, right? Law and Order for a long time was the, was the longest running series on television. Uh, there's the various CSIs. We love true crime stories. That's not new. In the 16th and 17th centuries, in the earliest days of print, there were these true crime stories that normally had some gruesome crime followed by the attempt to figure out who did it and the brutal punishment. This pope in particular produced a number of these during his reign, including ones mostly produced by his government to say, look at what a good job I'm doing at keeping the streets clean. But this narrative didn't seem to say that. Like he let these cannibals go on for a long time. And in fact, the narrative itself said that people in Rome were so hungry for meat that they ignored the acts of cannibalism. People are like, those sausages are weird. And they're like, no, man, they're good. It's so tasty. We're not, let's not worry about that. These were striking claims. And in fact, they said that the sausages endured, enjoyed even more popularity because there was a war going on. Um, for those of you who are not super familiar with the early modern period, I don't expect you are, this is a period of massive warfare few dates to keep in mind. In 1517, you're probably aware, Martin Luther, Martin Luther posts his 95 Theses. That's the beginning of a dramatic break with the church. Already by the 1520s, much of Europe has broken into a number of Protestantisms. Very shortly thereafter, they would come to blows. Most of the 16th century is dominated by religious warfare of one sort or another. By the time we get to the 17th century, this combines really into one massive war the Thirty Years' War, and this is a, a map of this war. It combines all the major monarchies in Europe. It results in casualties that will not be met by any war in Europe until the First World War. Literally millions of people die in this war. In previous narratives, places like Spain and Italy, the real uh, bastions of the Catholic faith, had been untouched by this war. It mostly happens in Germany and to some extent in France. This pamphlet also alleges, though, that this cannibal butcher pamphlet, that the reason that people wanted meat so much and this human meat was because food had run out. There's a small offshoot war of the Thirty Years' War called the War of the Castro, which is normally portrayed as a minor conflict. But what actually ends up happening is Rome gets laid siege to and their food runs out. There's a line in the pamphlet that says, these chubby Romans who were so used to eating so much meat that when it ran out, they couldn't handle it and had to find an other source for their meat, i.e. humans. This was another sort of signal that something strange is going on. No one's eating too much meat in the 17th century, I thought. This traditional narrative is that Europe hits a Malthusian ceiling. That means a moment where there's more people than the land could support. But triggered by this pamphlet, I started looking um, further and I found that indeed, Beginning in the early 17th century, especially under, under my previous guy, Urban VIII, there's a real attempt to bring more and more meat to Rome. To the extent, but by the 1630s, Romans are eating over a pound of meat per person per day, on average. The average is a little bit problematic. We can talk more about that later. And this then became my research project. So this pamphlet led me to a war led me to a food shortage, and led me to a realization that for a brief 50-year period, Romans are consuming more meat than anyone else in Europe. So then became a question, how did this happen? What are, the, what are the effects of it? 
I'm going to share that research briefly with you today, but let me just sort of explain a little bit of a pressy of it. Part of the reason this is so important is that food tells us so much about how people conceive of themselves in their daily life. Think about the choices that you just made today about what you ate. Were you worried about diet? Were you thinking about being comforted by your food? Were you thinking about how you'll be sustained as you go through today? I'm sure there were a mix of motives that you took with you when you went to consume your food. So too in the early modern period. And there was actually a meat moment in which literally doctors in Rome were saying, you should have more beef. This eating meat was part of being a good Catholic, being robust to defend Catholicism against those various religious minorities in Northern Europe who were challenging Catholicism and Roman Catholicism in particular. So studying food actually tells us a lot about what's happening in the culture of a given place at a given time. But also, as well as I'm gonna argue here, there's profound environmental consequences. Even though Rome's meat moment only lasts for about 50 years, the changes that it wrought upon the land are actually long lasting and still with Romans today. All right, so that's the setup. Let me back up again a second. So I'm here about 10 years ago in the Vatican archive and I find this crazy pamphlet. What do you do as a historian? Well, the first thing you need to know is, did anyone read this? Right, so that was my first task as a historian. Like, is this just, there's lots of stuff. I mean, think about like, if you, if you wrote some kind of crazy story in your diary and no one read it, it doesn't mean anything, right? No offense to any of you, if you're writing crazy stories in your diaries. You have to figure out whether or not other people read it, right? That's the first thing. So the first thing I did after finding this was to look around. And I found that in fact, it circulated. So in addition to the one I found in the Vatican, I found an other of pretty much identical pamphlet somewhere else in Rome one in Florence, and then another in London. And you might be saying, that doesn't seem like that many, you only found four. Okay, keep in mind you can't Google search archives most of the time. What I did was go to archival catalogs and was looking for brief descriptions of this. And the fact that I found four spread throughout Europe means that there must have been many more of these, especially if you think about survival for 400 years. So this is a narrative that circulated. So lots of people are hearing this tale of the cannibal butchers, tales about how meat in Rome had led people astray. But then there's another thing. It turns out, I'm pretty sure this is fake news. So not only did it circulate, it's a story meant to malign the papacy. And I'll tell you how I figured out this was fake news. After you find out it circulated, the next question is, is it true? Were there actually people eating people in Rome? Justice narratives tend to be very specific. They tell you the details of who was involved, who got murdered, where the trial took place. In Rome, in the 1640s, actually in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, there's one main criminal court. It's called the governor's tribunal. If you got accused of rape or murder or banditry, which is a bad crime in the early modern period, you'd end up before the governor's tribunal. Those records exist. Here actually is a trial from the governor's tribunal. I went through them for 10 years on either side of 1644. No cannibal butcher trial, all right? If you were looking for information about a crime in early modern Rome, you actually produced a poster. There's an entire archive of the posters related to crimes. So, you, you know, wanted poster, right? No poster exists like this. None of that's a smoking gun. Archives in the early modern period are full of holes, all right? There's two diarists writing this period, a guy named Carlo Cartari, another guy named Giacinto Gili both living in Rome. Most of their diaries are about like crazy stuff that happened. Oh, witches were accused of this day. These people were executed. They'd probably write about cannibal butchers, right? No cannibal butchers in their account. Finally, the governor himself, after he retires in 1644, is a guy named John Battista della Spada. He wants to turn a buck. He produces his own series of justice narratives called uh, The Memory of the Most Exciting Cases That co Occurred Under My Tenure as Judge. He doesn't mention the cannibal butcher narrative. I'm thinking if you want to sell print, you're going to mention the cannibal butchers. So it's circulated and it's fake. More, what the heck is going on here? Stay with me. There's a long sort of 10. I'm following you. I'm leading you through the archival trail I took. I keep finding more problems, right? So it's circulated, but it's not real. What does this mean? Well, as I already said, part of the key is the cannibalism. 
believe it or not, stories about cannibalism are actually really common in the 16th and 17th centuries. You're probably familiar with some of them. It's a normal story that colonizers tell. When, we, when Europeans landed in the Americas, when they landed in parts of Asia, when they landed in parts of Africa, they told stories of the indigenous peoples there and said, these people are so inhuman, they eat each other. It's a sign, it's a, it's a, a discourse that's used to subjugate people. It's part of the justification to be able to colonize the Americas. Cannibalism is used as a, as a, as a trope but it's not just indigenous peoples in the Americas. You're probably aware that there is a series of massacres of Jews in early modern Europe, in the 15th and the 16th and the 17th centuries. Frequently preceding one of these massacres is an accusation of cannibalism, the blood libel. Jews secretly are killing Christian children or, and eating them or perhaps just drinking their blood. It's a narrative that's used as well to justify religious violence against Jews, but also, as I said, religious wars are breaking out across Europe at this moment in time. Both sides, during the Thirty Years' War, during the French Wars of Religion, pick your early modern religious war, justify their worst atrocities by saying that cannibalism has occurred beforehand, right? These people are cannibals, so it's right that we're torturing them to death. Cannibalism is a trope that's used to cast people as being inhuman and therefore worthy of the worst sort of punishment. But I just said this is a fake. This story didn't actually happen. So if it's supposed to be accusing someone, who's being accused? Well, my argument is that this is actually propaganda against the papacy. The popes are being accused of basically you know, devouring the populace of Rome through their rapacious policies. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Rome had not been a city in which a lot of food was being consumed. It was constantly a city of want. If you look here at this map, this is 1640s, all of this area is uninhabited. This is the Vatican. Rome, these walls are the city, are the city walls of ancient Rome. It was a city of a million people. By the time we get to the 1640s, only 100,000 are dwelling in it. It's a city in which people are crouching in the ruins of ancients. The popes themselves have poor control of the countryside around Rome. They're not able to get the food supplies in that they want. And then beginning in the 1580s through the 1640s, a series of popes draft armies, take over control from various nobles in the countryside, basically pursue rapacious land policies to really secure meat supplies into Rome. I found that over the course of about 50 years, the amount of meat brought into Rome increases sixfold. This is in a moment where the population stays static. It's about 100,000 people. We have, by 1630s, 170,000 head of sheep consumed annually for a population of about 100,000. For comparison, the city of Florence, which is about 75,000, eats 13,000 head of sheep the same year that Rome consumes 170,000. Paris, which has 400,000 people, consumes only 80,000 head of sheep in the same year. Rome is a devouring beast, taking in all of the food from the countryside and eating it up. The popes tout this as a policy that shows how righteous they are, how they're defending Christianity by making sure that their people are getting enough meat, getting enough food. And indeed, this is a moment when it actually reaches pretty far down the social scale. Nobles, of course, are always able to eat a fair amount of meat, but Romans of a more middling class at this moment are able to eat beef, mutton, and pig with a fairly, de fairly high degree of regularity, several times a week. Even the poor seem regularly able to eat lamb. And in fact, orphans at the Santo Spirito Hospital, this is a huge orphanage, orphanage orphans are a real problem in the early modern world, are getting a third of a pound of beef to eat every day. Unmarried women, also a problem in the early modern world, how to support them, are getting two-thirds of a pound of beef per day. Meat becomes this huge thing in Rome. Everyone needs to be eating enough meat. But this then also leads to a problem. How do you control the countryside enough to bring so much meat into the city? The, Rome, the Roman papacy ends up stepping on the rights of the nobles in the countryside. They end up provoking angry rebellions. And this is what the cannibal butcher talks about. 
they became so gluttonous, these prelates in Rome, that they ignored the needs of the people in the wide countryside around them and provoked war. And that is indeed what the War of the Castro is really about. I said before that this is an offshoot of the Thirty Years' War. This war that takes about three years, from 1641 to 1644, brings an end to the meat moment. The War of the Castro is so named because the Duke of the Castro, this handsome dude here, Odoardo Farnese, he rebels against the papacy. The Castro is a realm in the papal states that no longer exists. You can see here's Rome. There's a Lago di Bolsena around Viterbo. That's this lake here. So that's the, Duke, the, du the Duchy of the Castro. In 1641, he rebels against the papacy. This guy had been a soldier of fortune in the Thirty Years' War. And the traditional story has, was that, you know, he just didn't like what the popes were doing. He wanted more land. He rebels. And there's, there's certainly some of that in there. But he also produces a pamphlet explaining why he goes to war. And he says, it's because the popes have been putting huge herds of sheep on my land. And I don't know how much you know about sheep. But sheep are rapacious animals. They will browse the grass down so low it dies, right? It's very, they're not very sustainable, large herds of sheep. The popes were pasturing them wherever they wanted in their lands to bring food into Rome. And Farnese rebels against it. The popes on the other side said that this war is also about food. They end up arguing that they're going to war because Farnese is not sending the grain to Rome that he's supposed to be sending to Rome. Eventually, the war brings in a whole bunch of powerful forces on the side of Farnese. He ends up inflicting a series of defeats on Rome and eventually leading to a siege of the city. The problem of obtaining enough meat in Rome becomes acute. We have stories of black markets of meat being operated at night, people selling it under the cover of darkness. I still got your sheep for you right here. There's all sorts of edicts about how third parties can't sell meat, which you wonder, what does that mean? Are people like keeping meat in their, sh in their coat and like, hey, here you go, I got some good stuff right here. In addition to all of that, although I don't think the story of the cannibal butchers actually happened, there's a whole series of trials. People who adulterated the sausage. There's an edict produced by the papacy that says, no longer are you, please, you're not allowed to put liver, heart, old blood, rancid fats into sausage and sell them. So although the story of the cannibal butchers is in part fiction, in part it's also reality, because it tells the story of how the city of Rome tries desperately to hold on to meat, even as their food supply lines are falling apart. And in fact, I go back up to one more image. On the Fabrician Bridge, this is this bridge here during this period, an old meat butcher opens up that is allowed to sell diseased animals, those who've been hit by carts, and those that are meat that's more than several days old, i.e. stinking meat. So there's this desperation to keep eating meat in Rome. Unfortunately, it doesn't work out. The war ends in 1644 with a shameful peace treaty for the papacy. And although the popes had been very powerful European rulers during the entire, for the most part during the Thirty Years' War, they're consulted when peace treaties are, come out, are coming out. When the war ends in 1648, the popes are politely ignored. That is, their political aspirations seem to evaporate with this war. But it's not just their political aspirations. The favored food status that Romans had enjoyed also disappears. By the 1650s, so within a decade, the amount of food coming into Rome drops by more than 20%. The number of farmers, I should say pastoralists, providing sheep to the city, and by the way, I keep using sheep as a metric because that was the food most common, that was the meat most commonly eaten by people at the time. A little different than our current time, right? The amount of pastoralists providing meat to the city of Rome drops by more than a third. The food supplies evaporate and they don't return. Rome will only consume the same amount of meat as it did prior to 1650 in the 20th century. So it's a long lasting change. One of my favorite stories of this is um, this fountain is in Piazza Navona in Rome. It's opened shortly after the war, it's in, in, early, in 1651. When it's, this beautiful fountain is unveiled, there's a riot and the Roman populace shouts, pane non fontane, that is bread not fountains. So a moment in which Rome had really enjoyed favored food status comes swiftly and brutally to an end. I've got three minutes left. 
I'll, I'll explain a little bit more why we should care about Roma's meat moment. First of all, it's a story that tells us how Romans eat today. If you go to Rome now, the cuisine that's Roman is things like paeta, which is uh, this. This is part of sheep's intestines served over pasta, oxtail, and tripe. These are the Roman dishes. And although poor in every city, of course, ate awful, O-F-F-A-L, not A-W-F-U-L, although both, right? In Rome, it becomes part of the cuisine because of the systematic unavailability of animals by, the, by 1800. They exhaust the countryside. And it's not just me saying this. There was a scientific study of pollen data from central Italy from the year zero, basically, until 2000. And this study demonstrates that there was a dramatic decline in the productivity of the land sometime in the 17th century. Now, this is a scholarly scientific article, so the authors don't speculate on what the cause was. But the meat moment, with its rapacious land policies, would seem to fit that. Likewise, I have contemporaries by the 1650s, by the 1660s, talking about how the land has changed. So it's a cautionary tale. It tells us that the policy enacted over the course of just 50 years by one government can have lasting environmental and agricultural consequences. That is, sure, there's large parts of Italy that are incredibly productive, but if you go to Lazio, that is the region that was the Papal States now, it's still super dry, still super arid, and the sheep herds are nowhere near the sizes that they were in the 1640s. And that's it. <laughs>